Hi, I'm James Thomas, and I'm going to talk about a fast decision rule engine for anomaly detection. So just as a brief overview of my presentation, we're going to be introducing a classifier based on one and two feature decision rules as an interpretable approach for supervised anomaly detection. And even though this approach kind of involves a lot of computation, we've made it practical because of the fast implementation that we have. Um, and then afterwards, I'm going to get a little more into the details of our Pandas API and then uh, show a demo as well. So just as an overview of supervised anomaly detection problems, they are generally binary classification problems with a large class imbalance. Essentially, often in your training data sets, you're going to have a very small number of actual anomalies and a very large number of uh, data points that are not anomalies at all. So this can often cause normal ML methods to struggle, you know, methods that are used to a more balanced uh, data set of, of uh, ones and, and zeros in the binary classification setting. And we want interpretability often in these problems because humans are involved in addressing the anomalies. You know, your anomaly detection system is going to say, hey, this data point is an anomaly. Uh, you need to go do something about it. And the human would like to know, okay, why was this classified uh, as an anomaly so they can better understand uh, how to deal with it. So these are kind of the characteristics of these sorts of problems. So now let's jump right in into um, the approach we're, we're going to take here with uh, decision rules uh, for categorical uh, tabular data. So we're going to be working with this kind of data and I'm going to show you uh, just in a little bit how to extend that to uh, continuous variables as well, but we'll start with uh, categorical variables for now. So uh, consider this example. Um, where you have cell phone telemetry, telemetry data. So um, you might have a few different features uh, that you get from all the different uh, cell phones that you have deployed over the, uh, around the world. You know, for example, you might have the operating system version. You might know the manufacturer, the age of the device, uh, the region the device is operating in. Um, and in reality, you might have many more features than this, but for this example, we'll just, we'll just look at these um, four. And then your class variable here, whether or not you have an anomaly, essentially, is this has error column. Was there an error um, in, during the phone's operation uh, recently? Um, so you can see that in this data set, we've got two anomalies and, and four uh, non-anomalies. So let's see if we can come up with a decision rule um, to uh, classify uh, our anomalies. So one potential decision rule that involves just a single feature is the o operating system version is equal to 4.1. So that's going to retrieve the four rows that you see here highlighted in green. Um, and it turns out that two of those are anomalies out of the four. So we have a precision of 50%, as you can see um, at the bottom here, and we've returned four total examples. So this is an okay rule, giving us decent um, performance. Let's see if we can uh, do any better. So a second rule, is this one, manufacturer is equal to Samsung. Uh, that's just returning one row. Um, and it turns out that is in fact an error. So we've got a precision of, of one out of one or hundred percent. We only returned one example. So, you know, maybe we, uh, we don't think this rule could generalize because it's kind of uh, specific to just, just a single example, but it, it does give us high, high precision. All right, now what about two feature rules? What do we mean by that? Well, uh, here's an example of one of those. So if the operating system version is 4.1 and the device age is equal to one, uh, then we return three different rows um, and it turns out two of them uh, have the error. So that's a precision of 66% and we've returned uh, three total examples. So this is, this is uh, quite a good rule, slightly higher precision than the first one, even though it returns uh, slightly fewer, fewer examples. Um, so that's kind of an overview of, of the one and two feature decision rules I was talking about to return anomalies from, from a data set. Um, so it's, you can see pretty clearly that these rules are interpretable, especially when they're limited to one or two features. You know, if an analyst sees that, okay, the operating system version is 4.1 and the device age is, is one, it turns out there's, there's a large number of anomalies. They can kind of make heads or tails of this. They can see, oh, that operating system version might not work well with, with the newer devices. It's kind of easy to, um, to comprehend and, and come up with a story um, for this. And you know, when you start adding way more features in your decision rule, that's when it's harder for a human to, 
to really understand the interactions there and, and, and come up with a story about what's going on. So you can look at similar methods uh, to this one, like decision trees, for example, especially ones that are quite deep or random forests, which are kind of an amalgamation of, of many decision trees. And you know, and even linear models, they're hard to understand because they don't kind of easily split up or, or kind of individually package up uh, interactions among uh, just one or two features. They kind of have all the features combined into one um, big, uh, big, big thing that, that you have to kind of parse or, or understand yourself. So that's the advantage here. So just an aside now, as I was saying, we can ascend, extend decision rules to uh, continuous features, um, uh, ones that have a, a continuous range of values instead of a, a fixed number of distinguished, uh, distinct values. And the way we do this is we find the min and max of the uh, continuous feature range, and we just discretize that range into uh, 15 equally sized buckets is what we do in our system. We chose the value 15 because it kind of works well um, in practice, and it also uh, helps us uh, with the hardware acceleration that I'll, I'll talk about briefly uh, in a bit. So, you know, you turn your continuous range now into, into 15 uh, different buckets. Um, and there's other discretization schemes you could do definitely that are not just this kind of linear uh, bucketing, but this is what we've done for this work. And it's definitely uh, possible as a future direction for us to, to add more, more different schemes. So I just talked about single decision rules. Um, and you know, to, to get good performance, as you might expect, we need to combine decision rules because a single decision rule is, is unlikely to be enough to classify across your whole range of of uh, examples. We saw in our, in the small example I showed, you know, you might have a rule like manufacturers equal to Samsung. And yes, it has pretty high precision, but it doesn't cover your whole range of anomalies. Um, so what we want to do is we want to create a classifier with many good decision rules that kind of cover the entire space of anomalies. And then if any of them fires on an example, if any of these decision rules fires or, or ends up being true, then we say that an anomaly is detected, you know, and, and more formally, we're kind of taking the logical or of all of the rules that we add um, to, our, to our classifier. And this is still interpretable, right? We said that a single decision rule is of course very interpretable. It's still interpretable when you have a classifier with, with many decision rules, because a human can kind of see which, which rules fired for a particular example, and they can um, you know, kind of analyze what those those rules are doing because each rule is pretty simple. And you know, what I'll talk about a little bit later is also we try to keep a fairly small number of overall rules uh, in our classifier. We try to prune out uh, kind of redundant rules so that you can look at all the rules in your classifier if you'd like and, and kind of understand them and it's not an overwhelming number of them. So how do we evaluate decision rules and choose good ones? Because we said we want to we want to just pick good ones to put into our classifier. Well, we use um, a bunch of different counts that I'm going to talk about here. So we're going to maintain a count of anomalies and total examples classified for all possible one or two feature decision rules of the forms that I was showing before. So equality decision rules. So what is our table um, going to to look like with with all these counts, well, you know, uh, you're going to have some uh, entries in your table that only involve a single uh, feature, right? So that's like the first row in this table where, you know, the feature is OS version, the value is 4.1, uh, there's no second feature. And then, you know, if you go back to our data set, you can see, okay, that one uh, gives two actual anomalies and returns four total examples, as I was, I was showing earlier, giving us a precision of 0.5. And now we can look at, okay, for OS version is 4.1, uh, what are the two feature rules um, uh, involving that one? So then we can bring in region, for example, region is equal to Asia, and it has, you know, the, the number of anomalies and total examples returned that you see there, and the precision, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine that this table ends up getting quite large, right? Because, you know, especially for the pairs of features, you have kind of a cross product of all um, features and then all values uh, within each pair of features as well. So we're computing all of these counts and then um, we're, we're going to use this information to, to select good rules. So um, this table ends up uh, getting quite big. So that's that's kind of what I was alluding to. Um, you know, when, when you uh, have these two feature uh, counts, uh, it, the computation ends up getting quite expensive to compute this 
this large table. So, um, you know, the, the way we're able to, to make this approach practical is we've got a fast C++ implementation that's fully parallelized to uh, compute all these counts. And we also have experimental uh, GPU and FPGA acceleration available. You can see this all at the uh, GitHub that, that I'll, I'll link in a little bit. So in practice, we can scale to the thousand feature range um, even for fairly large data sets. So you can generate new features from the existing data that you have if you want to um, scale up a little bit and, and see if you can come up with better decision rules um, or, or you should be able to work with, with fairly large data um, for, for this method. So how do we actually select um, decision rules um, based on, on the table that, that I showed before? Well, we're going to filter on the precision and the total count of examples um, uh, returned by each decision rule. So in particular, we're going to create a classifier with all decision rules having precision greater than some user specified p thresh and total examples um, returned by the, the rule greater than some user specified c thresh. So that's going to give us um, a, a classifier with, with a, a large number of rules and it's going to operate the way that, that I mentioned uh, earlier. But um, as I was kind of alluding to as well, you likely want to prune decision rules um, from your classifier because this, this scheme is, you know, you might have fairly tight thresholds, but it's still probably going to return a fair uh, number of, of rules. And in fact, the overall classifier is likely to have lower than P thresh precision. So remember, P thresh was the threshold to select individual rules and you're combining all of them together, the overall classifier with the combination of all those rules is likely to have lower than uh, that, that precision because there'll be more overlap in the selected rules, actual true anomalies than in the false positives uh, that they return. So if you think about that, you can see that the net um, precision goes down. And this isn't always true, but, but it's uh, often, often the case. So what we wanna do is we wanna prune redundant rules that are kind of returning similar sets of anomalies. We don't need both rules because they can return different sets of false positives and, and hurt our precision. And furthermore, by pruning these kind of overlapping and redundant rules, we're also going to have fewer overall rules in our classifier. It's going to make it easier uh, for the user uh, to actually look at their whole classifier, all the rules and, and comprehend them. So that's, that's something we want to achieve. So there's many ways to do this pruning. And one heuristic that we've implemented in this work is sort all the rules that you've selected for your classifier according to the filter from before. You sort them descending by the total number of examples that they, um, that they retrieve or classify. And then you iterate through these rules and you compute the incremental precision of each rule. So the number of new anomalies it classifies um, over all the previous rules that, that were um, kind of above it uh, in the iteration, uh, divided by the number of total new examples that it classifies compared to uh, previous rules. Um, and we're going to discard rules that have incremental precision less than some uh, user specified p thresh prime and incremental examples classified greater than c thresh prime. So you can kind of see how this is discarding rules that don't really do much compared to the previous rules um, that we've looked at. So in particular with this heuristic, uh, when you set the p thresh prime to be very small, a little bit larger than zero, like 10 to the minus two or something like that, and you set the c thresh prime to be one, all this does is eliminate rules that have no correct uh, incremental classifications on the training set. So this basically means that they, um, you know, the only rules you're going to throw out are ones that don't classify any uh, new anom true anomalies at all uh, beyond um, beyond the prior rules. So uh, as you can, as you could infer from that, what that's going to do is strictly improve the classifier's precision on the training set uh, with no change to recall. You're still classifying all the true anomalies that you would have on the training set, but you're actually eliminating rules that may have just brought in extra false positives. And so other heuristics beyond this kind of sorting um, scheme uh, to, uh, to prune decision rules are possible, but this is the one we've implemented. Uh, in this in this work. So now finally, I'm going to give you a quick summary of the Pandas API before getting into the demo. So um, first, we have a method called compute sums that basically computes that entire uh, pairwise table I was I was showing before. 
on the training set. So you have to give it also the name of your class variable. Um, and so then we return this, this sum object S. And then, you know, with S, you can get uh, rules um, according, you know, to the P thresh and C thresh that you want. Um, and that's going to return a data frame of all the rules um, that kind of pass uh, those, those thresholds on the, on the uh, training set. And then we have a prune method, like I was talking about, where you can, um, you know, give it give it your existing list of rules. You can give it a set of examples to uh, to use when uh, determining uh, kind of incremental performance. That you know, generally you want that to be the training set, and then you give it the p thresh prime, c thresh prime, and so on. You can display the rules in kind of an easily human readable format, and you can also evaluate um, your set of rules, which is essentially your classifier on some uh, test set to return the precision and the recall um, on the anomaly class um, for that classifier. So that's our, our API summary. And um, now I'd like to get into a demo and you can see that uh, the, the GitHub is, is here for this, um, for this um, tool. So you can, you can take a look and try it out yourself and I'll show you how to do it um, in the demo. And you can also get in touch with me uh, at this email address, thanks. All right, so let's take a look at a demo of uh, our rule engine system. So we're assuming here that you've gotten it already from GitHub um, and you've installed it. So you can, if you're on Mac OS like I am here, you've installed the LLVM uh, dependency with, with Brew and then you've uh, just pip installed uh, the system. So we're gonna get into the virtual environment that we have here where we've installed everything. Uh, Oh. There we go. So we're inside of our virtual environment. And now we're going to get into the examples directory and I'm going to show you the rookies example. So let's just take a look at that uh, example first. So here is the, um, the code for that. I'm going to walk through step-by-step uh, -step, uh, in an interpreter. So let's get a new interpreter here. So first we want to import our rule engine as RE and then import pandas as PD. Um, and so we've got this data set uh, about basically NBA rookies. So essentially all players that have ever been in the NBA until 2017, we've got their rookie stats. So like 30 or so different statistics on them. Um, and then the uh, variable we're trying to predict is if they ever become an all-star at any point in their career. So only 10.10% of NBA players ever become all-stars. So it's sort of an anomaly detection uh, problem in a sense. So let's read that CSV uh, rookies first. Uh, just print this thing. You can see it's got around 4,000 um, rows of, of different players. And you can see it's got several different stats and we've got this if all-star uh, column at the end. So um, now let's let's uh, compute all the sums over this data as I was showing before. So we want to do re.compute sums of df and the if all-star uh, column. Okay, so this essentially prints out a summary. It computes the sum and it also prints out a summary of all the different columns um, in the data set. So it doesn't use the player column, for example, that makes sense because you, know, you don't want to use the player name to, to predict anything, right? So it sees that the cardinality of this column is too high and, and discards it. Um, and then it shows you, okay, was a variable uh, continuous? And if so, you know, what was the range used to discretize it, as I said before, um, or was it categorical? Um, so you can see we've got a bunch of different statistics like you know, your standard win shares, field goals, um, so on and so forth. And it also shows the overall mean of the data set. Um, you know, as, and as I was saying, it's about 10% of, of players that have the one um, in the if all-star column that became all-stars. Okay, so that is um, the first uh, step. And now we wanna just get the rules, um, uh, you know, that, that meet a particular threshold. So let's get rules that have at least the precision of 0.7 um, and classify at least 10 distinct examples in our, our training set. So these are, are, are one feature or two feature rules. Okay, so we've got 
the rules uh, sitting right here. And this is also a data frame. You can see this isn't super um, interpretable and that's why we got this display method to um, print out uh, the, the rules. But you can see it's similar to that table I showed in the presentation where it's got uh, the first feature, the value of that feature, the second feature, if there is a second feature in the rule, if there's not a second feature in the rule, it's gonna be uh, minus one, the second feature's value, the total count of, of examples that are classified by this rule and the positive fraction, which is the same as the uh, precision. And this is sorted by um, by the uh, total, total number of examples classified. Um, so let's see how we, this is a, a fair number of, of rules and let's see how we did um, on this. So if we do evaluate summary um, and let's just see what our um, uh, API is there, it's we want to pass in our data frame. So we're just going to evaluate this on the training set for now. You could have a separate uh, test set if you want. Um, so you can see that this gets about 56% precision overall, which is, as I said earlier, this is likely to be the case when you amalgamate many rules, the overall precision of the classifier goes below the precision of individual rules. So here overall is 56, even though the precision of individual rules is, is 70%. And then the recall is about 60% um, of the actual um, all-stars are recalled uh, here, which is, so this is pretty good performance because this is kind of a, a hard problem, but um, let's see if we can we can prune some of the uh, rules that are kind of giving us only false positives and not really adding any any new true classifications um, to our to our results on the training set. So um, we can do this prune rules uh, here with um, rules stop prune rules um, on the data frame. Are, let me just double check that one more time. Yep. And we're going to use this small value of P thresh and this one value of count to do exactly what I was saying in the presentation, just prune out um, only stuff that gives us false positives and no uh, new anomalies at all. So this is pretty, pretty safe to do. We're not going to prune any potentially good rules generally. Okay, so now you can see we've only got um, 60 rules, which is which is kind of nice. Um, so we've got 60 rules, it's a smaller number, and we're going to now evaluate summary on the DF. And you can see that we've got the exact same um, recall here. Uh, we're still recalling about 60% of the uh, true all-stars, but we have a better precision because we removed rules that, that really weren't adding any, any extra value. And now finally, what we can do is display rules so we can get kind of a human readable um, output here. So you can see all the different rules. Um, and again, it's sorted by the total number of examples classified. So you can see kind of the heavy hitter rules that are, that are classifying a lot of uh, stuff uh, correctly at the top. So you can see, okay, if the games uh, played was from 77 to 83 and the uh, player efficiency rating was, was in this range, you actually 72 percent of the time this player if they had those looking uh, stats will, will go on to be all stars and so you can see a bunch of other rules there's only 60 of them so it's pretty pretty easy to um, just go in um, and uh, and analyze uh, what's going on and you can see anything with a comma here uh, has two rules and then there's some that like this one that only has a single or two features and some like this one that only has a uh, single uh, feature involved in the rule. So yeah, that's that's that. And uh, hopefully you try this out and, and find it useful. Thanks a lot. All right, so thanks again, everyone, for listening to my presentation. And once again, you can uh, take a look at um, the, the repo here at this GitHub link. And if you have any issues at all, um, you know, please, please send me an email uh, at, this, at this address. Thanks again.